the newlywed Duke and Duchess of Cambridge began a lifetime of foreign tours with a visit to Canada on behalf of Queen and Country. Their happiness shone through all the ceremonies. And Catherine, known to the world as Kate, received a rapturous welcome. In one golden year, they've succeeded in making the royals relevant once more. In this program, we look at their first magical year of marriage and how they've adapted to their private life and public duties. We reveal how Kate prepared for nearly a decade for her role as a princess, national ambassador and style icon. Responding to an international crisis and committing to charity work, the couple have brought a fresh meaning to the monarchy. As Britain's heir in line and his future queen celebrate their first wedding anniversary, we look back at the year that made them the most famous couple in the world. Canada, summer 2011. There was little sign of Republican feeling when thousands turned out to welcome the royal guests of honor. Just two months after their spectacular wedding, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge were on their first official foreign tour. It was a charm offensive to one of the most important parts of the Commonwealth. The final stop was Calgary, home of Canada's Cowboys. William and Kate had come to launch the annual Wild West Rodeo, the Calgary Stampede. The nine-day visit of the prince and his new wife had surpassed all expectations. Amusing events like this disguised the serious intention of the tour. This young, attractive couple, with their unstuffy and friendly approach, had come to preserve Canada's link with the monarchy. It was Kate's first big test as a member of the royal family, representing the Queen abroad. She and William worked as a team. It wasn't just Catherine that created that reception, it was both of them. What was so lovely, and I think probably of great relief to Prince William and certainly to his courtiers, was that the attention to them was to both of them. It wasn't all about Kate. Of course, there was a curiosity, as you would expect. We just had the royal wedding. There was such heightened interest in our new Duchess of Cambridge, the, the future Queen of England. Of course, you would expect that. But the Canadians were just as happy to see Prince William. I mean, they absolutely adored him. And what they did was they worked as a package. I think in those events leading up to Ottawa, the engagements that Kate and William took on as a couple, they very much learned how to do the royal walkabout so you'll notice that when they arrive at something they'll split and one will take one bank of people and the other will take the other but there is equal adoration and praise and affection for both of them it was not a case of Charles and Diana where everyone just wanted to see Diana and only people wanted to see Kate they wanted to see both of them as a package on July the 1st Canada Day Kate wore the national colors of red and white Half a million lined the streets of Ottawa to see the royal superstars in their first carriage ride since their wedding. And the crowds still grew to welcome William and Kate. The temperature reached a sweltering 90 degrees and everyone was feeling the effect. No one quite knew how they were going to be received. Um, and when they first landed in Ottawa, I mean, the cheers and the roar of applause was just so huge. I mean, it was just absolute adoration. In French-speaking Quebec, William pleased everyone by making his first public speech in French, thanking them for their warm reception. <laughs> Nous débutons aujourd'hui notre première tournée ensemble. Nous ne pouvions pas être mieux accompagnés que par la grande famille canadienne. Kate was relieved that William's speech had been faultless, but he joked about his accent. <laughs> The couple moved on to Prince Edward Island. In a cooler and damper climate, William learned a new skill as a search and rescue helicopter pilot. In a Sea King helicopter, he practiced water bird landings, a technique used by the Canadians, but not by the British Royal Air Force. 
Kate watched anxiously from the shore as William easily mastered the tricky manoeuvre, showing a high level of piloting skills. Then it was time for a dragon boat race. Kate had once trained with an all-female crew. Now she was out to prove her skills against William's all-male team. The two teams rode furiously across the 200 feet course, with William's team crossing the line marginally ahead. Afterwards, a loving cuddle delighted onlookers. This is one royal marriage that will surely withstand temptations. William is very affable and easygoing, and I feel that if William misbehaved, which is possible because those Windsor men are not renowned for their fidelity, I think that Kate would turn a blind eye. She wanted this marriage more than anything. And I think she loves William very deeply and she will make a very happy life for him. And, and there will be no reason for it not to work. From Canada to California and a dazzling charity dinner with old friends like David Beckham, Kate and William met Hollywood's most glamorous celebrities. Like Diana's old friend, Tom Hanks, and some well-known faces. They're flying the flag high, and it's great to see, and they're very glamorous as well. You brought back to life Clark Gable and Marilyn Monroe, they wouldn't excite Americans this much. Oh, they make me smile, I love them. Uh, I saw Nicole Kidman literally just uh, just go to jelly. Uh, she met both of them and uh, everyone wanted a little piece of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. Tom Hanks was someone who he had a, a real rapport and connection with. They've actually met before. But, I mean, William was, was in his element talking films with the stars of the movies. They had a quality about them that none of the Hollywood stars possessed. And I, I guess that quality is being royal. For a start, I'd just like to thank Colin Firth uh, for my perfect opening line. <laughs> I have a voice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you got there in the end, it was good. For their first public event as a married couple, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge were guests of honour at a gala dinner for the children's charity, ARC. In a shimmering pink dress by designer Jenny Packham, Kate was the main attraction amid the wealthy and famous. The event raised over 17 million pounds for disadvantaged children. Kate knew that all eyes were on her and that the media would analyze her appearance. Accompanied by his stunning wife, William had grown in self-confidence. He spoke with candor and honesty. I know that I am very fortunate. I've had a good education, a secure home, and a loving and supportive family. So many young people, however, do not have these advantages, and as a result, can lack the confidence and knowledge to realize their full potential. Charity is very important both to William and, and Kate. Obviously, William strongly resembles his mother and, and would want his wife to be a humanitarian too. The first affair of state attended by Kate after her wedding was the annual Trooping of the Colour Ceremony. William took part wearing full military dress. Kate proudly watched her husband riding in the parade. This is her new environment surrounded by members of the royal family, all celebrating the Queen's official birthday in June. It was the Queen's big day, but inevitably attention was on the newlywed William, wearing his ceremonial bearskin and guards uniform. And crowds crammed into the mall to see Kate standing on the palace balcony for the first time since her wedding. She would join the royal family for events like this for the rest of her life. Inevitably, Kate will be compared with William's mother, Princess Diana, the last big royal star. I don't think Kate has got that dazzle factor of Diana because Diana was a tragedy, you know. Diana walked along the route of, of people waiting to see her and she told them little things about her life. And we knew so much about Diana, we're never going to know that much about Kate. I mean, Kate's been around now for nine years. We know nothing about her. 
nothing really about her. Maybe there's nothing to know. But with Diana, nine years in, we knew everything about her. I mean, I remember Diana saying to me, you even know how many fillings I've got in my, <laughs> in my teeth. But we don't know anything about Kate. On their last public engagement before their wedding, William and Kate visited Blackburn in Lancashire, one of the poorer parts of the country. Guided by William, Kate was learning the royal way fast, ready to take on the life ahead of her. The couple opened a new state school and were clearly at ease with the pupils and their own happiness evident to all. A newspaper front page summed up Kate's joy and hopes for the future. Two months before their wedding, William and Kate's first public engagement together was in Anglesey, the Welsh island where they've made a home. The Royal National Lifeboat Institution asked them to launch a new lifeboat. May God bless her and all the sailors. Kate performed the launch without a hitch. After the launch, Kate joined in the singing in both Welsh and English. The couple made a sentimental journey back to St Andrews University, where their romance began. This is a very special moment for Catherine and me. It feels like coming home. Despite being one of Europe's leading research institutions, the third oldest university in the English-speaking world, when William began St Andrews University at 19, he was one of the world's most eligible bachelors. His choice of bride became a source of media speculation. Kate was just one of a number of girls linked with William. Before her, the student prince had an adoring circle of rich and well-connected admirers. But which one of this bevy of beauties would become his princess? The newspaper's guessing game continued for years. Kate's main rival was William's childhood friend, Jekka Craig. The palace even denied reports of a romance. And before he started dating Kate, he had a six-week fling with fellow student Carly Massey Birch. Catherine would have seen him with all these very pretty girls, you know, Carly Massey Birch, who's still a friend, Olivia Hunt, other, other, other girls, who are all, you know, fabulous looking socialites and so on. But she has triumphed over all of them. So she will be able to take a degree of comfort from that. And quite frankly, you know, she's a very good looking girl herself. In 2007, William and Kate temporarily separated. The split was blamed on his military life. After university, they found it hard to keep their romance on track. William wasn't ready to make Kate his bride when he had years of military training ahead. William was very hard at work with his military commitments and it became increasingly difficult for the couple to spend time together. He spent weekdays in the barracks and then enjoyed time off with his fellow servicemen. He had to do well in all aspects of military service. Like his grandmother the Queen, one day he would be head of all the armed forces but his career opened up new experiences away from Kate. It's pretty simple, really. Prince William's alpha A male, red-blooded, thought he could do better. Thought the grass was greener on the other side. I mean, and as a prince, you walk into a room and you get used to the fact that every single woman in the room is looking at you and thinking, I fancy my chances there. And Catherine, she wanted more commitment from him. He wouldn't give it. They split up. She did what girls who've been jilted for, for centuries have done. She put on a brave face, went out and had fun and seemed like she didn't have a care in the world. She put on something that was short, high and tight, looked great. And he was there watching the newspapers and thinking, hmm, I don't want somebody having a roll in the hay with my girl. I'd better get back with her. After a brief spell apart, William soon realised what he had lost and that he might never find anyone as good as Kate. He was soon on his motorbike, romancing Kate again at her home in the village of Bucklebury. It wasn't only Kate he missed, it was also her happy, comfortable home life with her parents, sister and brother. 
This became his ideal and the Middletons became the role models for his future with Kate. The whole family had joined Kate when William finished his army training at Sandhurst with a traditional passing out ceremony in the presence of the Queen. At such a high profile event, their presence was taken as a sign that Kate had become the official girlfriend of the Prince and that her family were important to him. Kate's mother was an air hostess and her father a flight dispatcher before they started a party goods business that made them millionaires. William's snootier friends poked fun at Kate's mother because of her working class roots. However, the Middletons will help with the upbringing of the next royal generation. I, I think William is incredibly close to Kate's family. He spends a lot of time with them and he's very fond of them. He is attracted to, to the stable upbringing and background she's had and, and I'm sure that he and Kate will want to replicate her childhood for their own children. Kate enjoyed normal childhood activities like joining the brownies. For the little girl who became a princess, her family's discretion was absolute. Today, they remain her closest confidants. One of the things which attracted him to Catherine and also to the Middleton family is the fact that they're a safe, steady, stable family. And, he's, um, and much of their courtship was spent at Bucklebury, the family home, uh, having a quiet pint in the local pub, away from prying eyes, away from uh, long lenses, but just enjoying casual, normal life with the Middleton family. The truth is that she's had to edit her friends. Uh, and that's the reality. Uh, I suppose when you date a future king, that's that's going to be part of it. Uh, she had a big circle of friends at St Andrews University. I would be surprised if she's still friends with perhaps half of those. But if you ask me who her best friends were, I'd actually tell you her mother and her sister because they really are the ones with whom Kate can entirely confide. They know her inside out and better than anyone else. And I, and I suspect that with her future royal role, um, which is so all-encompassing, she will need that support network. And, and where she always goes is back to her sister and back to her mother. As William's girlfriend, Kate became public property. Every aspect of her childhood was scrutinised. There were stories about her being bullied at one of her schools. Her uncle Gary was caught out in a scandalous newspaper sting. Her brother James, then a student, was pictured wearing fancy dress. The most damaging criticism was about Kate's lack of proper career. A graduate in art history, she worked part-time for her parents' business but had plenty of leisure hours while William was away. I think Kate's in an invidious position. She has been with William for a long time, eight years, and, and to have to go into work every morning and not be able to talk about what you did the night before it is very difficult. She's had to trust people and She's worked with her family. Saying that, many people in this country work for the family business. It's not that unusual of all, all backgrounds. And she's been working quietly behind the scenes and, and helping them earn a living. After leaving university, William undertook a specially tailored training scheme in each of the three armed forces. As king, he will be commander in chief of all branches of the British military. After long stints away in the army, he spent a short period with the Royal Navy. However, it was his Royal Air Force training that he liked best. That determined his choice of career as a search and rescue pilot. Flying fixed wing aircraft and later on helicopters became his passion. He described flying solo as an amazing feeling. William and Kate had been together for eight years when they announced their engagement. They were both 28 years old. His parents hardly knew each other when they became engaged in 1981. Diana was 19, Charles 31. And I, I, I'm amazed that she's uh, been brave enough to take me on. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> 
there were no hesitations with William and Kate on the day of their engagement. They were at ease and happy with each other. You look back to the photographs of, of Charles and Diana and, and that dreadful comment he made, which when he was nervous about whatever love means. I mean, you can imagine if William had said that to Kate, she'd have um, given him a smart tap on the shoulder. It did take a bit of time for us to get to know each other, um, but we did become, you know, very close friends from, from quite early on. William had lovingly kept Diana's engagement ring after her death, and he gave it to Kate when he proposed to her. It's my mother's engagement ring. So I thought it was quite nice because um, obviously she's not been around to share any of the, um, the fun and excitement of it all. This, this was my way of keeping her sort of close to it all. And I guess we better, we better have a look at it. What, what kind of ring is it? Are you an expert on what? I'm uh... not an expert on it at all. <laughs> I've been reliably informed it's a sapphire with some diamonds, but I'm sure everyone recognises it from, uh, from previous times. So. It was a poignant reference to his parents' broken marriage. Everything about William you can uh, trace back to what happened to his parents. Um, he lived through the bitter breakup of their marriage. He knows um, how much uh, what happened to them destroyed their marriage. He's very concerned not to make the same mistakes. I suspect there are all sorts of things running through his mind about all this, what happened to his parents, particularly what happened to his father, who clearly made a terrible choice when he was a young man, and he doesn't want to do that. Thank you, oh, yes, it's a normal cool. colour. Is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> you can't remember how many times you died in there, can you? No, I don't. <laughs> I was just, like, really angry at me for a minute then. Yeah. yeah. In 2007, singer Joss Stone helped William and Harry organise a concert in Diana's memory. Amid the big names from the entertainment world, William still had the star quality that has impressed so many people. I remember seeing him at uh, St Mary's Hospital. He returned to the birthing unit where he was born and nurses were literally swooning in the corridors because he was around. He has got that X factor, but whether he's comfortable with that um, is another matter and I don't think we'll see him doing the kind of performing, perhaps, that his mother was famous for. Sorry to keep you all waiting. Oh, I'll try and keep on time next time. Be <laughs> what we also know about Prince William is, while he is very much his own man and certainly won't be told what to do, he likes to decide it for himself, he's also been very clever in surrounding himself by an extremely tight-knit group of friends, the so-called circle of trust, who friends from Eton, for instance, who really he now trusts implicitly. Among this gilded circle are the Van Cutsum brothers. William was an usher at the wedding of his old pal Edward Van Cutsum and the Duke of Westminster's daughter. When Catherine met William, she was really punching above her social weight. She was, after all, a girl from a, a middle-class home dealing with the upper classes where everybody who came for dinner was lord or lady this, the Van Cutsum family, for example, great friends of the royals, especially of Prince Charles. You know, mixing in those kinds of circles, she will have felt in early on quite intimidated about it. And I remember that one of their friends telling me that, that Catherine didn't like the fact that, you know, she'd be cooking in the kitchen and being treated a bit like a skivvy and William would be chatting away to some, you know, lord or lady who was a, a student at the, at the college. Like his father before him, William loves polo, a game for rich players that attracts the higher echelons of society. Kate has learned to mix with the polo playing clique, part of William's inner circle. This has not always been easy. That social divide did create tensions early on in the relationship. Now, uh, Catherine is friendly with most of William's friends. In 2008, William and his fellow Royal Air Force cadets were presented with their wings by Prince Charles at a ceremony at RAF Cranwell. Kate was waiting inside, seated with Diana's sister, Lady Sarah McCorkadale. They all watched as William stepped up to receive his insignia from his proud father. Note how William turned to see Kate's reaction before leaving the platform and how Kate noticed his attention. Flying officer William Wales was starting out in the branch of the military with his colleagues. 
He took part in a photo shoot with Charles and his stepmother Camilla. William has long accepted Charles' second marriage and welcomed Camilla as a companion for his father. She will prove a good advisor for Kate. In choosing a career in the RAF, William was departing from the tradition of royal service in the army or navy. Kate had to wait for William until the time was right for marriage, so behind the scenes she prepared for her future role. I, I think Kate has taken on the role and, and knows what is expected of her. There are benefits and, and there are downfalls to, to any job and she has signed up for it and is welcoming it with open arms. Flight Lieutenant William Wales, as he is now known in the RAF, pilots Sea King helicopters, sometimes flying over the mountains of Snowdonia in treacherous weather. After a long day or night with his colleagues, he goes back home to Kate at their rented cottage near his base at RAF Valley in Anglesey. In spring 2012, he spent six weeks on duty in the Falkland Islands. It's a life he seems to prefer to his royal duties. He's, he's only done a handful of royal engagements. He's done a couple of short uh, royal tours on his own. He's not, he's not really being a fully-fledged member of the royal family firm. So, in a way, he's learning the ropes just as she is. And he's not used to being the star of the show. He's left that to his dad. For a boy who likes to be out of the limelight, you know, likes to be watching soccer on TV, watching a movie, he'll, let, he'll be thrilled if uh, the burden of taking on public duties is left to Catherine. At their Welsh home, Kate is a real housewife of Anglesey, shopping and cooking for her husband and running their cottage without full-time staff. She's an organised girl. She's, she's always been that way. She's, she's the kind of girl who enjoys things like sewing and knitting, and she was taught to, to do that by her grandmother. And I, I always find it interesting that the sewing that was so beautiful on the wedding dress, again, that's an influence of uh, Catherine. So she's a girl who's organised in a very feminine way. After a £1 million renovation, the couple will move into Princess Margaret's old apartments at Kensington Palace. This is very near Diana's former home, where William and Harry grew up. While the apartments are being refurbished, the couple live in Nottingham Cottage in Kensington Palace grounds. When they move out, Harry will move in. William has left the apartment's decoration and design details to his wife. Kate's very much at the helm of the refurbishments. She has a, a keen eye for all things interior. Of course, her passion is art, and she's going to be very hands-on with this project. So while she's based in London at Kensington Palace, she's made visits to the apartment. She has some ideas of what she wants to do for the refurbishment, but they won't actually be moving in until 2013. They will have more rooms probably than they know what to do with. There are four floors of these apartments, and they are, they are largely viewed as the most most luxurious and best positioned apartments. They have their own courtyard and garden. It's going to be the perfect base for them and of course the perfect family home. Kate has married into one of Britain's wealthiest families. At his investiture as Prince of Wales in 1969, Charles inherited the huge Duchy of Cornwall. When he accedes to the throne, William becomes the next Duke, benefiting from the Duchy's rich estates and revenues, which produce an income of over £17 million a year. The royal family has palatial homes like Balmoral in the Scottish Highlands and Sandringham in Norfolk, where they spend Christmas. Charles's country estate in Gloucestershire is Highgrove, set in 900 acres of farmland and gardens. William is a country man at heart. Like the rest of the royal family, he enjoys country pursuits such as hunting. While Kate was not brought up in these traditions, she's having to adapt to William's way of life, both in public and private. When their parents separated, William and Harry came under the watchful eye of Tiggy Legburk, who's from a family of landowners and courtiers who understood royal customs. Harry flourished under Tiggy's guidance, and her kindness helped him to deal with the loss of his mother when he was only 12. 
Harry still has this daredevil quality, quite different from his more serious older brother, who has the duty and burden of kingship ahead. A year after Diana's death, William and Harry made a brief visit to Canada with their father. Teenage girls treated the boys like rock stars. William was overwhelmed by it, unlike Harry, who lapped up all the attention. Harry became a career soldier, serving on the front line in Afghanistan as a forward air controller with his regiment, the Blues and Royals. Even in warfare, Harry found adventure with a discarded motorbike and revved it up for the camera. Harry's on-off girlfriend, Chelsea Davy, was invited to the aristocratic wedding of the Duke of Northumberland's daughter, Lady Katie Percy. There is still a hope that Harry and Chelsea could marry one day. There's great passion between the two of them when they're together. The, the, the tension is visible, there's electricity, there's sparks flying everywhere. You can tell that they have a very volatile relationship, tremendous shouting matches, screaming rows, but then they get back together again. I would say that of all the, uh, the royal romances uh, currently going on, theirs was the real true thing. It's a real deal. Harry has found a new friend in Kate, who's like a sister to him. He spoke in advance about William's wedding. We were a little small wedding with just his really close friends, but you know, we are who we are, and the position comes with it, and the role comes with it. So, um, yeah, he's gonna at the end of the day, he's, he's gonna walk down that aisle with his wife, and so, so that's fantastic. When Kate married William and became Duchess of Cambridge, it was Pippa, the maid of honour at her sister's wedding, who also grabbed the media's attention. People were fascinated by Kate's sister, so much so that there's even a Facebook page dedicated to Pippa's pert bottom, regarded as the perfect shape. On the palace balcony after the wedding, the obvious rapport between Harry and Pippa caused speculation of another possible royal romance. Press soon had wind of Harry's secret meetings with attractive Pippa, who's two years younger than the Duchess of Cambridge. The sisters are hugely competitive, with sibling rivalry over fashion and fitness. But Pippa is Kate's closest ally and never lets her down. Pippa enjoys the benefits of royal connections, the attention, the designer clothes and the best weddings. Pippa Middleton was a guest at the wedding of Katie Percy, daughter of the wealthy Duke of Northumberland. Pippa is an old friend of Katie's brother, heir to the title and the family's huge estates. Some predict that Pippa will marry him and become a duchess too. Her last boyfriend was Alex Loudon, a rich young stockbroker, handsome and suitable, but he didn't like the endless publicity around Pippa, who is now Britain's most eligible girl. I feel quite sorry for Pippa because Everyone thinks Pippa loves all this attention she's getting, but she doesn't. She hates it, and it really stops her from leading a normal life. She can't go outside. She can't go and empty the trash. She can't do anything without being photographed because the appetite for Pippa photographs is enormous. It's like, if we can't have Kate, let's have Pippa. And poor girl is pursued relentlessly, and I think it's very difficult for her to get on with her life, and therefore very difficult for her to find a, a, a decent boyfriend. Her first relationship broke up because there was just so much attention focused on her that he couldn't deal with it. Kate's brother James quit university to start a cake-making business linked to his parents' company. He has also been the subject of media attention. James. Middleton is is very interesting because you might recall before the royal wedding, James was really making headlines for all the wrong reasons. Uh, there were pictures that were leaked on Facebook of him dressing up in his sister's clothes, drinking, misbehaving at Edinburgh University, all the sorts of things that students get up to. But unfortunately for James, found their way on the net. There were even rumours about his sexuality. So James was very much the, the focus of the paparazzi. He was billed as the, the, the second black sheep of the family after Kate's uncle, Gary Goldsmith. And uh, I think people were watching, actually, for James to trip up. But what happened on the day of the royal wedding was that James presented a completely different public image. He delivered the most faultless 
reading at Westminster Abbey. Not only is he dyslexic, he memorised that reading. James has deliberately kept below the radar since the wedding. I think he's desperate not to be seen to be cashing in on his sister's royal connections. And Kate's mother, Carol, also has to be careful about publicity. She knows she must avoid talking about Kate's position and private life. Carol Middleton is, is, is an intelligent woman and she knows that if she starts discussing her, her daughter's life, it, she's going to make her daughter's life very difficult. And she's the one that wanted her daughter there. She's worked very hard to get her there. Why go and spoil it? I remember being told that the first time Kate took William home to the Bucklebury home, she instructed her parents and her family that William was to be made to feel at home, that they weren't to discuss him coming over to the house with their friends or extended family. There was a, a vow of silence um, and I think a a trust, a bond of trust, right from the start of that relationship. And Carol and Michael grew to love William, I guess, you know, as one of their own. They've, they've really welcomed him into the family fold. So I don't think we should be surprised that there is this bow of silence. <laughs> On William and Kate's wedding day, television cameras recorded the royal guests arriving at Westminster Abbey. The great and the good, the famous and the unknown, politicians and potentates, friends and relatives, all assembled for the wedding of the century. The cameras captured some very well-known faces. Then came Tara Palmer Tompkinson, a reformed drug addict and friend of the royals in an eye-catching hat and dress. Pippa arrived at Westminster Abbey, confidently in charge of the young bridesmaids and page boys. London crowds cheered and millions watched on their televisions as the bride, whose family tree includes coal miners, came to marry her prince. This was a real-life fairy tale come true for the whole Middleton family, who all helped to make it a perfect day. The Middletons have already, already played a great role by producing a girl as delightful as Catherine, who will help William lead the monarchy through into well into the 21st century. But they've also shown their mettle during the royal wedding. I mean, you know, Pippa looked fabulous, James read very well. Um, Michael and Carol really, you know, uh, were the doting, loving parents, and they added to the spectacle, added to the sense of the family. So, you know, if the royal wedding was the renewal of the vows between the monarchy and the nation, the Middletons played a very um, significant part in that. Kate has now become the world's number one trendsetter. Everything she wears sells out instantly. On her engagement day, she wore a blue silk dress by Daniela Haleil, whose Issa label Kate has made popular. The one designer that Kate's really put on the map is Daniela Haleil Issa, uh, a very charming Brazilian, talented dress designer. Kate's been wearing her creations for years, uh, and I don't think it was any accident that Kate chose to step out in an Issa gown for her engagement day. It was the traditional crossover jersey dress in this beautiful deep blue that totally set off her sapphire engagement ring. The staple design of Issa is a crossover jersey dress, often in a bright print, beautiful colours, perfect for the cameras. In fact, she wore a beautiful purple evening gown in Canada for an evening event. Uh, it was a pop concert and Kate turned up, and this is what I love about her style, she might have felt the pressure to be a little bit trendy, but actually what she went was for something sophisticated, elegant, and in the most royal hue you could possibly choose. And she worked it, I mean, she looked great. Back in London, Kate's natural habitat for clothes is Chelsea. Despite its reputation for designer clothes, there are many off-the-peg shops such as Hobbs, Oasis, Zara, Reese and Orla Keeley on the King's Road. 
One of Kate's first public engagements was a visit to Rose Hill Primary School near Oxford. She wore an off-the-peg all Achille coat. Kate's mother sometimes acts as her personal shopper, finding the right outfit for the occasion. And what Kate's doing is not just getting people into the high street over here in Britain. She's putting those names on the map internationally. And I know from having interviewed the uh, chairman, the chief executive of Reese, that people in America cannot now get enough of Reese. And that is down to the Duchess of Cambridge. Kate's wedding gown was a triumph for designer Sarah Burton, creative director of the late Alexander McQueen's fashion house. But Kate has spread wide her patronage of designers and shops. She's affiliated herself with British fashion designers, right from the haute couture end, Alexander McQueen, Jenny Packham, um, Amanda Wakeley, big British designers. And then she goes right to the other end of the spectrum, top shop. Well, that's just fantastic because I think anyone that walks into Topshop and can buy the blazer, the blouse, the dress that the Duchess has stepped out in feels that they've been able to achieve a little bit of royalty. At Alderhay Children's Hospital in Liverpool, Kate wore a high street coat from Hobbs over a plain black oasis dress. With her trademark tumbling hair and ready smile, Kate looks wonderful in any colour. Like Diana before her, she has an easy affinity with children. She is also tactile and connects quickly with everyone. But William's wife and his mother were very different women. I think Kate and Diana, much as we love to compare them, are very, very, very different characters. And I think also Kate is so much older. Diana was 19 and Kate was 29. It's very, very different. And I, I think that Kate has also had William at her side for so many years, um, you know, telling her all about his world and his life. And I think she knows a lot more what to expect. Kate and William opened a new £18 million children's cancer unit at the Royal Marston Hospital, the setting of Diana's first solo engagement in 1982. She wore a simple but shapely figure-hugging dress by Amanda Wakeley. Kate has said that Diana was an inspirational woman to look up to. Now she has started taking on some of Diana's charity interests. In this, she is encouraged and supported by William. She's a bright girl and she can always uh, look for a real true role to play, like, like Diana did. It took Diana many, many years to find that true role. In late 2011, Kate and William made their first joint humanitarian mission to a UNICEF depot in Copenhagen. They were joined by Crown Prince Frederick and Princess Mary of Denmark. For once, Kate's outfit, a crimson coat, was considered a fashion faux pas. Kate drew attention for all the wrong reasons, actually. She was wearing a coat, uh, I believe it was LK Bennett. It was a rather wonderful coat, but it almost looked a size too big. It um, had bundled up at the back where it was belted. Um, and of course, everyone was quite convinced that the reason she'd chosen to wear such a big coat was because she was hiding a baby bump. So we were all spotting or trying to spot the bump. And of course, when Kate refused to try this peanut paste during one of the, um, the aid missions, um, the rumor mill went into overdrive that she absolutely must be pregnant. At the depot, Kate and William helped pack boxes of aid and medical supplies bound for East Africa. They were responding to the UNICEF famine appeal alongside Frederick and Mary. It's always in the background. Uh, it's been going on for, like Catherine's saying, at least 100 days now, and it's not getting any better. You know, the rains have come now, and as, as hopefully you've all heard from the UNICEF brief, that that doesn't necessarily mean that things are going to get better at all. In fact, disease becomes a huge issue. Um, and so it's very much a case of, of anyone who can do anything to help, um, please do. And Catherine, are you hopeful that being here can make a difference? Well, we really hope so, to, put, to really put the spotlight back on, on this uh, terrible crisis and um, really to try and raise the awareness. You know, I, I was shocked by some of the um, statistics and I think other people would be if they've lost track of the story. When it's very small. The two royal many, couples many listened intently to, to an expert's briefing. Kate has a great deal in common with Australian-born Princess Mary. 
as far as Princess Mary of Denmark is concerned, she she has a lot to offer to Kate. They come from very similar backgrounds. Um, she's an Australian. She is a commoner to all intents and purposes who married into the royal family and has had to deal with that international spotlight being shined on her. So if anyone's in a position to help Kate, oh, it's her. The daughter of an English earl with a stately home, Diana married Charles 30 years before Kate married William. Had they met, Diana and Kate might have had a strained relationship. I think Diana would be rather jealous, actually, of the fact that uh, Catherine has already got a very finished fashion sense, um, that she's very much in control, very capable, uh, with a great eye for detail. Diana always wanted a, a daughter, always wanted to mentor a daughter through the labyrinthine world of the royal family. She'd have enjoyed teaching Catherine the ropes, but there'd have been a twinge of jealousy that she was passing on the fashion baton from one generation to the next. William's commitment and love of Kate evokes the unconditional love that Diana gave William. Kate wears Diana's ring. She will live in her old palace and she will devote the rest of her life to her elder son. But could having a couple so popular in line to the throne have consequences for Prince Charles? Prince Charles is the longest serving Prince of Wales in history. He's not gonna give up his chance of ruling, of being sovereign, uh, nor would Prince William want him to. He wants to re remain in the background for as long as he can. Uh, but sadly, the opinion polls have been against Prince Charles for the last 20 years. For 20 years, the British public have wanted William over Charles to be king. And if, quite frankly, if the House of Windsor was a popularity con contest, William would win it hands down. Kate chose to make her first public speech at the Treehouse Hospice in Ipswich, where she is a patron. She wore a blue wreath dress that her mother had previously worn at Ascot. Kate read her speech very carefully and slowly. Understandably, she sounded a little nervous. First of all, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you for not only accepting me as your patron, but thank you also for inviting me here today. William was away in the Falklands on a six-week tour of duty. Clearly missing her husband, Kate spoke about how they worked together. I'm only sorry that William can't be here today. <laughs> he would love it here. A view of his that I share is that through teamwork, so much can be achieved. Kate is doing such a great job. Um, all of those years, I suppose, of being nicknamed Weighty Katie by the British press, um, we now really see what was happening the whole time. Kate has been clearly groomed for this role for many years. Every time she steps out, I think she proves herself to be the most formidable ambassador for this country, along with her husband. I think what's so special about these two is that they do work so well together as a team. They clearly love each other. There's a great bond between them. And actually, when you travel with them and you watch them carrying out these tours and these engagements, it's absolutely clear to see uh, that they, they really are meant to be together. I feel enormously proud to be part of East Anglia's children's hospices and to see the wonderful life-changing work that you do. Thank you.